the properties are bad. Properties are the specific rules that tell us when we can do something. So the first one. The commutative property of. What does commutative mean? What does to commute mean? Have you ever heard the word commute before? Dart is a commuter system. What does it do? It moves people from point A to point B. Your car is a commuter vehicle. It drives you from point A to point B. It moves you from one place to another place. That's what commutative means, to move. So the commutative property of addition. I have any any two numbers. It doesn't matter what it is. I can move them around. I get the same answer. Three plus four equals four plus three. The order of the numbers doesn't matter. Three plus four is seven, four plus three is seven. So it doesn't matter with the order, I can move them around. The same thing goes for multiplication. Multiplication, the commutative property says X times Y is the same thing as Y times X. Three times four equals the same thing as four times three. They both equal 12. Okay, in this course, you're gonna hear me say the term binary operators. Binary operator is just another way of me saying these symbols. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. These are called binary operators. Why are they called binary operators? Because they really don't mean what they what they do unless there's a number in front of it and a number behind it. You need two numbers to make it mean something. The plus sign. It doesn't mean plus until, unless there's a number in front of it and a number behind it. The subtraction doesn't mean subtraction unless there's a number in front of it. If there's a number behind it, is it subtraction? No, it's just a negative now. And same with multiplication and division. It means nothing unless there's two numbers. Now, another thing, multiplication. This is the tricky guy. It's the only operation, only binary operator that doesn't have to be there to be there. In other words, what I'm saying here is this. All four of these represent the same thing. They all mean multiplication, X times Y. There's a symbol, that's a st asterisk. There's a dot, x dot y. That means x times y. x times y. And if there's nothing between them, that means multiplication. So for example, 
When I say 3x, what does it actually mean? 3 times x. All right. So that's the first property. That one says we can move them around if it makes life easier for us. The next one is the associative property of addition. What does to associate mean? What do you do when you associate? Yeah. yeah, when you put things together, or people even, you're grouping them. When you, the associative property is actually the grouping property. For example, if I had three numbers, x plus y plus z, doesn't matter what those are. x and y and z are variables. They can be anything you want them to be. For example, I can have three plus four plus five. It's the same thing as three plus four plus five. True? Yeah. But how would you do it? If I gave you this equation, how would you solve it? Left, right. You do three plus four plus five. Yeah. In other words, that's a truism saying that nothing in our known universe, there's no machine, nothing that can process more than two pieces of information at any one time. It's impossible. You have to have two things to compare, to do things with. So this is where, if let's say I tell you, I want you, I want you to do three plus four first, or if I want you to do four plus five first. This is where the concept of parentheses come in. With parentheses, I am grouping these two elements. Remember, in, print, in the order of operations, we're supposed to do parentheses first. Well, yeah, that tells you do what's inside that subgroup first. So here we're going to do 3 plus 4 is 7. Four plus 5 is 9. 7 plus 5 is 12. 3 plus 9 is 12. So the associative property says if we have a series of or equations that are all the same, if they're all addition or all multiplication, we can, we can pick whatever two we put together first. Because we know from the commutative we can move them around. So we can move them around and group them as we want. So we have x times y times z equals x times y times z. Good morning. Now, this example will, sh will demonstrate the importance, how, how it makes life easier for you. What if we had three times four times five or Three. Work these two out and tell me which one, which side's easier to do. So, what side do you think is easier? The right side. Let's look at why. In this one, we have three times four is 12. 12 times five is 
60. How did you get 60? What did you have to do? Five times two is 10. Put the zero, carry the one. Five times one, add the one. It's a lot of moving parts. Let's look at this one. Four times five is. So whenever a number ends in a zero, we just multiply three times two is six and put a zero behind. The more work you do, the higher your chance of making a mistake. The more steps you take to solve a problem, the greater the chance of error. This is human nature. The more, so think about that is the longer you take, the, the, the farther you go around the actual path, the, you have more things you write, the more chances you have of dropping a negative or putting a negative or misadding or miscalculating, it happens. So this a perfect example. For example, if I gave you, we had this example here when it did special operations. Anybody know what that is? You ever seen it before? In mathematics, not in English. It means N. No. What this means, it's a it's called a factorial. What it means is whatever number is in front of it. Start from that number and multiply everything down to one. So three factorial is three times two times one, which is six. That's a fact. It's used in statistics. It's a counting technique in statistics to tell us how many ways something can be done. So what's that going to mean? So what do I write down here? What does that mean? Yeah, six times five times four times three times two times one. What we would normally do, we'd start from left to right. But is that the only way? Is that the easiest way? No, see, I would do five times two is 10. So I have 10 times, let's say six times four is 24. Three times one is three. You can group them wherever you want to. Why is this, the, I think, easier? Because what is 10 times 24? Or even, what is 24 times 3? Four times 3 is 12. Six is 72. 72 times 10 is 1 times 72. Put a zero behind it. Two hundred times thirty. Without writing it down, what's the answer? Spit it out. What's that? Are you asking me or are you telling me? There's no 10 there. Yeah, whenever you multiply things with zeros, like for here, just multiply the numbers. Two times three is what? And we have one, two, three zeros. Yeah, it is 6,000. Whenever you multiply numbers with zeros, just multiply the, co the numbers in front 
and then just put as many zeros as you have. It's just a short way of doing it, right? What would that one be? What's 25 times two? 50. How many zeros do I put behind it now? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So it's five million. Yes, whenever you have zeros of the numbers, it makes it much easier to work with. Okay, so that's the associative and commutative properties. That means we can group them together, we can move them around, as long as the operations are the same. The third property is my favorite. It's probably the, one of the most important ones. The distributive property. No, you can't do it. There is no of. It's just this, it's just, just the distributive property. There's no of. Because you notice in the first two properties, we had to separate addition and multiplication. The distributive property combines the two. Here we have multiplication and here we have addition. So in this property, we combine the two. What's this, the A, remember A, X, and Y could be anything. They could be letters, they could be numbers, they could even be equations. They could be anything. What's the number in front of parentheses called? Or the number in front of a letter, what is that called? We had this, what is this number called? What is that number called? Starts with a C. What's that? Not a constant. Because remember, it could be a letter, it could be an equation, it could be anything. Very good. It's called a coefficient. What this thing tells us is since this A times this, what it tells us is whatever is in front multiplies to everything inside there. So A times X is AX. Positive times positive is positive. A times Y is AY. So one of the big uses of distributivity is to get rid of parentheses. It gets rid of parentheses. Why is that important? Because we can't solve an equation unless all the parentheses are gone. Because we have to have, in order to solve something, like for, solve it for x, we can't have any parentheses. So we have to get rid of the parentheses. And this is how we get rid of it. But it also has multiple purposes also. Now, I said this is one of the most powerful properties. How many of y'all took chemistry? Remember what stoichiometry was? The balancing of equations? This is an example of a stoichiometric equation. If I go from this, from here to there, that's called distributivity. If 
because I get rid of the parentheses. I go from here to there, it's distributivity. Now, if I go this way, it's called factoring. We're going to spend a lot of time doing factoring. Basically, what is factoring? What do both of these equations have in common? An A. So we take the A, put that in front. Whatever is left goes inside the parentheses. So I remove the A, put it out in front. Whatever is left, X plus Y, goes inside parentheses. That's how factoring works. And we're going to spend a whole chapter and a half on that. So again, it's a very powerful tool. How about that? What would you get? Yeah, so we can we do anything inside the parentheses? No, because they're not like terms. So what is three times four? Well, well, let me write it down. So we have three times four. That's the first step. Positive times positive is positive. 3 times 2x. This is the distributivity. Whatever is in front, I just put it in front of, I just put it in front of everybody inside there. And I get rid of the parentheses. 3 times 4 is 12. 3 times 2 is 6x. X. Does it always work? Well, let's see. Let's look at this two ways. One way, if we follow the order of operations, this is the order of operations. And this is distributivity. If we follow order of operations, what do we have to do first? Inside the parentheses first. So we got to do this. We have 5, 2 plus 4 is 6. What is 5 times 6? 30. Now, with distributivity, let's distribute. We got 5 times 2 is 10. And uh, let me not, not jump any spaces. So I have 5 times 2 plus 5 times 4. 5 times 2 is 10. 5 times 4 is 20. 10 plus 20 is 30. So it doesn't, remember I said, there's not one right way to solve an equation. As long as you follow the rules, you'll get the right answer. It's just that in the rule, you can't just change it midstream and do something else. You got to follow that rule out to its completion. So yeah, the, they both work. The identity property of what? What do you think? What is an identity? What is your identity? It's who you are, right? Same thing with numbers. So for the addition, let's say we had a number x. x plus what lets it keep its identity? So for example, 3 plus what gives me 3? 0. 
So zero is the additive identity. If you add zero to anything, you don't change it. How about multiplication? X times what gives me X? One. No. Three times one gives me three. The inverse property of so with this one is x plus what the inverse which gives me zero. What's the inverse of a? I mean, of x. Very good. Negative x. So 3 plus negative 3 gives me 0. Multiplication. What times x gives me 1? One over x, very good. Why is it one over x? Because this equation is x over one. The inverse of a multiplication is a flip of it, the reciprocal. So if I had three fifths, what would I multiply to it, to make it disappear? Five over three. So what these inverses are is to get rid of something. If we if we have something multiplied and we get rid of it, multiply by its reciprocal. Has to be the same sign though. If we had a negative three fifths, we'd have to divide or multiply by negative five thirds because we want to have a positive one as an answer. Signed numbers. Adding of same signed numbers. Charging. So adding the same. So we have three plus five. They're both positive. So the answer is going to be what? They're both positive. Answer is going to be positive. Three plus five is eight. Remember, keep the signs and the numbers separately. You have to determine whether the answer is going to be positive or negative. Negative three minus five. They're both negative, so the answer is negative. Five plus three is eight. So basically, here's what it says. If the signs are the same,
then take the common sign and add the numbers. If the signs are the same, take the common sign and add the numbers. If they're both negative, the answer is negative. And then add the numbers. Adding different sign numbers. Adding different sign numbers. What is that called? If the two numbers have different signs, what are you actually doing there? Exactly. This is what subtraction is. Is when you're adding upside. Because remember we did all those properties? We never talked about subtraction or division. And I'll get to that in a second, why that is. So for example, 9 minus 3 is what? Positive six. Nine is bigger than three. It's positive. Nine minus three is six. Negative two plus eight. Which number is bigger? Eight. Eight is positive, so the answer is going to be positive. Eight minus two is six. Four minus nine. Is the answer going to be positive or negative? Well, yeah, because nine is bigger than four, isn't it? And nine is negative, so the answer is going to be negative. Nine minus four is five. Negative five. Again, treat the signs and the numbers separately, and you won't have the mistakes of signs that often what this rule says is this if the signs are different then take the sign of the larger number, take the sign of the larger number, and subtract the smaller number from The larger number. So with this, you always subtract bigger minus smaller. To be honest with you, this is where the most most errors occur. It's when people have different signs on their equations. So let's go back to the properties. Remember said in the properties, we didn't talk about subtraction or division. Why not? Because, like computer engineering, subtraction doesn't exist. How do we just define subtraction? Add 
adding opposite signed numbers. That's subtraction. So we know that 3 plus 4 is the same thing as 4 plus 3. 3 minus 4. Does that work? No. 3 minus 4 is what? Since 4 is bigger, it's negative. 4 minus 3 is negative 1. 4 minus 3 is 1. They're not the same. Because subtraction is not an operation. It's the addition of an, a negative number. So 3 minus 4 is actually 3 plus negative 4. Because now, if I do this, then the commutative property still works. Again, 4 is bigger than 3, so the answer is going to be negative. 4 minus 3 is 1. 4 is bigger than 3, it's negative. 4 minus 3 is 1. Multiplication and division of signed numbers. There's only one rule here. Can I guess what it is? Y'all seen this before, haven't you? Y'all see something like that before? If you have two numbers that are positive and you multiply them together, they become positive. Two negative numbers become a positive. So it's three times four is positive 12. Negative three times negative four is also positive 12. That's what this means. If the signs are different, 3 times negative 4 is negative 12. Negative 3 times 4 is negative 12. That's what this these symbols here mean. Positive times positive is a positive. Negative times negative is a positive. Positive times negative is a negative. Negative times positive is a negative. So basically, this is a true statement, but it can be expanded. You notice this one has two negatives. This one only has one on each of these. So if you have an even number of negatives in your equation, the answer will be positive. If you have an even number of negatives, your answer will be positive. They're all multiplied. 
So remember, multiplication and division, same thing, same level. So treat the signs and the numbers separately. Is the answer going to be positive or negative? Why? There are one, two, three, four negative signs. You count the number of signs. If the number of negative signs on the entire equation, if it's even, the answer is going to be positive. Since we know our answers are going to be positive, we don't have to worry about these signs anymore. We can just multiply these and go on. 5 times 2 is 10. 4 times 3 is 12. 12 times 10 is 120. So, again, yeah, I'm trying to get you guys away from what, what you were taught earlier. Try to treat equations signs and numbers separately once you do that your work gets cut in half pretty much it also works with fractions So is the answer, okay, first question, answer going to be positive or negative? You're asking me, aren't you? Is it positive or negative? It's positive. How many negatives do we have? Four. They're even, is four even? Yes. So the answer is going to be positive. Whatever the answer is, it's going to be positive. So I can get rid of these negatives now. Now I can just worry about the numbers. Now, whenever you deal with, whenever you multiply fractions, what do you do first? How many of y'all were taught to multiply first, top by top, bottom by bottom, and then simplify? So how would you do them? Or then... Always reduce first. Simplify first. Make the numbers smaller before you multiply them. They're all fractions. True? It's a fraction. Every number can be written as a fraction. It's called rational equations. Every number can be a fraction. If it's a number, it's divided by one. If it's a fraction, it's okay. What you do here, since they're all multiplied together, anything on top on any of those numbers can cancel with anything on the bottom. What you have right now is one big dividing line. So for example, this three and this three can cancel. 15 five goes into five once, five goes into 15 three times. Two goes into 16 eight times. Eight goes into eight once. So we have one, one, one times two. Nine times one is nine times three is 27. And that's your answer. It makes it much easier to use smaller numbers on a final answer. Because I know I don't have to go any further than this. If I can't simplify it here, I can't simplify it there. So your first step, whenever you have fractions and you're multiplying, always reduce first.
question I had in my classes yesterday that stumped a lot of people. Not that. Ah, there it is. There, work that one. What is this number? What kind of number is this? What's it called? What kind of number is this? It's not a fraction. It's not a number. It's both. It's called a mixed number. A mixed number. To, to convert it, the bottom stays the same. The top, take the constant times the bottom number and add the top number. That's how you convert it, and it becomes what's called an improper fraction. Improper fractions if the top number is bigger than the bottom. So four times three is 12 plus one is 13 over three. So that's how that one becomes. Don't worry about the negative sign. It's four times three is 12 plus one is 13. So far so good? Now we have a division here. What do we do with the division of divisions? Whenever you have a fraction of a di fraction divided by another fraction, change this sign to a multiplication and flip. This, the number behind it. Which what we want to do, we want to get it all to be multiplication. And they're all multiplication. Is the answer going to be positive or negative? It's going to be positive. Because we have a negative sign here and a negative sign there. It's two of them. Can anything cancel? Yeah. This three and this three cancel. 
this three, three goes into three once, three goes into nine three times. Two goes into two once, two goes into four twice. So we have one times one times 13 times one is 13. One times three is three, times one is three, times two is six. There's your final answer. But in reality, you're never supposed to leave your num your answer as an improper fraction. You can never have the bigger number on top than the bottom. So how many times does 6 go into 13? Two times. With how many left over? One. And there's your answer. This is how it... This is where we got this real number here. Six goes into 13 twice. Six times two is 12. So whatever number you have here, that goes in front. This remainder goes on top. And the denominator stays on the bottom. That's the easiest way of doing it. Okay, what we're gonna do, we're gonna end it here today because we, that's, that's the review of math I wanted to give him. Get everybody on the same page. Because I know some of y'all have been away from school for a while. Some of y'all may have been just uh, polluted by calculators. So I'll make sure everybody can do this on, on pencil paper and in their heads. Because ha having to, re to go to your calculator every five seconds to do basic math is gonna take you, it's gonna eat up all your time. So the more you can do this pencil and paper or in your head, the easier it's going to be in this course. So what we're going to do next time is I'm, when we come in here, I'm going to give you two questions over this kind of stuff. And whoever gets it right will get a prize. Whoever doesn't, we'll keep on working on it. And then next time we're going to, next time we're going to have a review of our trig identities and stuff. Because that's another part of this course. And then after we finish this week, then we can start with calculus. Because I can I can tell you right now, where we're gonna start off the whole calculus thing. Who knows what that says in mathematics? What's that? What is M? Come on, have courage, louder. What is it? Slope. What this means is the change of Y over the change of X, which is our slope equation y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. That is calculus. That's where we're going to start off next week. But I want to go over the, make sure you trig this up to part two. Okay, so this is where calculus begins in, in the slope formula. You'd never think it was that simple. But, okay, we'll do that. One week from today, we'll start in the calculus, but I want to make sure all your trig rules are up. All right, any questions? Okay, okay, everybody. Then I will see you all on Thursday here. Next week, yeah. Yeah, if, because I like the size, because I know we have a lot of people doing this online or uh, independently. So if we're going to have this small, would anybody be 
against moving to a room downstairs? Yeah, because I, coming up here just for one class or two classes is too much walking. I'm talking about closer to the door, like one room 133, uh, 122 or something like that. It's got a seats for like 16 people. So this would be perfect for us. Okay, Ray, I'll let you know one way or the other. All right. Have a great, safe day, and I'll see you Thursday. I keep on thinking it's Thursday. I'm hoping it's Thursday. Bye-bye. <laughs> Go ahead. What's the question? Ah, that's a very good question. They well, let me, um, they should be. Well, let me see. Let me get on to my. Yeah, somebody asked ask a question on how do we find all the old lectures and stuff like that. So we go to our course. See, now you guys realize why I don't like having emails sent to me because I go through all this stuff multiple times. Ugh, it's just a pain. Let's see. Calculus 2. Which one are we? Or oh, Calculus 1. Okay. We are 62002. Course videos. Ah, okay. I haven't, I will have to upload those this afternoon. In this, in this tab, that's why I'll have all the, the video lectures and solutions from previous uh, semesters. So you have the entire year, entire semester at one glance. So that's where it's going to be. You're welcome. Have a great day. What's that? This is our second meeting. Upload. Yeah, this is our, remember our first, oh no, our third meeting, because we had Tuesday, Thursday, and Tuesday. So it's, the first day was nothing but talk about the class. And so this is our first real type of lecture.